So today what I'm going to do is focus on two particular aspects that I think will help us use the tool to its best potential. And that is dignity driven practice and understanding the process of change. So today is a bit of an opportunity or this afternoon just to stop and think about the decisions that we make and our part in the decisions. Um, Dana just said that fairly eloquently in that video about what we bring to this work. Um, so we're going to have a look at some of the things that we might bring, some bias, some assumptions, um, our privilege and how things like supervision and the restoration tool or any of the structured decision making tools have been put into our system as a way to try and safeguard our practice from those things. The restoration tool is the opportunity for us to slow down and think and balance our intuitive work and our thinking with our analytical thinking and all the knowledge that we know and we've heard about today. The decisions we make about whether we take children, return children or keep them at home. So I'm going to run through a couple of scenarios and just by a show of hands just tell me would you if you were the caseworker, do you think you would have taken that child, um, returned that child or kept them home? So, this is Shamuri and Ainsley. Um, they're eight and six year old little girls. Shamuri was taken into care when she was two and Ainsley when she was born. Prior to that, the family had a house fire when the parents were away and their little brother died in that house fire. Their mum, Sheridan, was also in a, um, in a relationship with a man who was really violent towards her. The point that we knew about Shamori, she was struggling in out-of-home care. She was really kind of um, suffering. She had a number of labels and pills attached to her. And the only way that the professionals around her could support her was by calling in the police to manage her behaviour. So these are two little girls, they've been in care for a decent period of time. Just by a show of hands, who would look at returning those girls to their mum? Yep. So they are back home with mum. Um, and Shamari's not on any pills anymore, no labels, no police, and she goes to school every single day. Now this one, this one's a lesson for me in showing your boss your presentation before you deliver it, um, because she gave the spoiler and did say that we, um, we did take these kids into care. Um, so this is Jessie and Jane, they're one and three. Um, they were living with their mum, who was a heavy ice user, and she was not able to meet their needs couldn't feed them, couldn't attend to what they needed. She was driving around in the car with the kids in the back, trying to score her next deal. And she was aggressive. So um, Alison found it really hard to work with the caseworker and often um, screamed, yelled at her. So we know that these girls were taken. Who would look at returning these girls to their mum? So not too many, yep. We did return these girls. So Rebecca, the caseworker, she didn't have an easy job on this. She had to absolutely persist in her relationship with mum, but she was clear from the very minute that she took those girls from mum that she was going to return them. And she persisted through everything, even when mum didn't believe that that was possible. She talks about her work with, um, with Alison being a slow burn. There was no light bulb moments. There was no switch of the flick, flick of the switch. Um, she just had to persist. This is Nikita. Nikita was 15 when she had her first little boy, Nash. Nash came into care a couple of months after he was born. Um, at the time, caseworkers were worried that Nikita was transient, they suspected that she might be using drugs and she wasn't working with the support services that had been put around her. Nash started losing some weight and was put into hospital and was taken into care. Would you guys return Nash? 
I'm um, you would. Yep. So just under two years later, Nikita went on and had her second child, Chase. He, um, at that time, she still had some fairly unstable accommodation and we didn't really know about her drug use. Would people think about taking Nash into care or keeping him at home? So hands up if you would um, consider taking him. Yeah, a couple of people being brave, yep. Um, so we didn't take, we didn't, didn't take Chase. Um, Steve, a great caseworker, saw some good potential in Nikita and saw that we had maybe built some assumptions around her drug use and that at the end of the day, she was a 17 year old young person who needed our help to find a stable home. Um, one of the great things that this mum did is when she had Chase in her care, she got herself off to school. And that's a picture of her in um, the Dale School where she takes her little boy every day. But let's not forget about, about Nash. So who would return Nash given that I've now told you the story about Chase? Yep, so most of you would. The sad reality for Nash is that he's still in care and he had a plan for adoption, even though his little brother, or his old little brother, um, was able to stay at home without any reports. So this story is a really good reminder of when you are looking at preservation or restoration, the need to look at the whole family unit. Um, Steve, being the great caseworker that he is, is now working really hard with the NGO to get Nash back home where he belongs. And I might just do one last one, I'll skip through. So this is Kyle and his little, boy, his little brother Mason, who's one. Kyle's 14 and they also have a sister, Kayana, who's 13. Um, Marette was raising the kids on her own and again was using ice. And she'd, she'd had a pretty long habit of using ice um, and had been unable to keep accommodation stable. Kyle had left home as a result of his mum's drug use and Kayana was starting to take on a really strong parenting role for Mason. Who would consider removing these kids? Some would? Yep. Yeah. Um, so Jalissa, the caseworker, didn't take these kids. She worked with them. Um, she helped mum get, um, get off the ice without going to rehab, which was one of mum's kind of clauses, um, and she did really well. And now Mason is at home. His older brother has gone back home with them, so he's now reconnected with his mum and lives at home. And um, Kayana is this amazing young girl who um, has won herself a scholarship and is going to be a neonatalist in the future, so quite a successful little family. The reason that I showed you these is some of the themes running within these family stories are fairly similar, yet for all of them we ourselves made some different decisions and in this room we didn't get consensus on what we would do with those children. And that's why the restoration tool is part of what we have put on the agenda today. Even though I won't be training in it, it's about understanding its place in trying to help us be more consistent with the decisions that we make. So I'm going to talk a little bit about dignity driven practice and you would have had a touch of this in any of the framework briefings that um, you have been part of or are going to be part of. Um, this isn't training on dignity driven practice either. This is quite a simple but multi-layered approach to a different way of working. And it's particularly relevant to restoration, I think, because we, we have to acknowledge that if we've taken a child from a parent, that must be an affront to their dignity in some way. And that we do have a role in giving back that dignity by the way that we work with them. So, back to the Oxford Dictionary again, which describes dignity 
as the state or quality of being worthy of honour or respect. If we don't genuinely hold that the parents that we work with are, are entitled and deserve our honour and our respect, um, and that they're worthy of that, we're never going to be able to return as many kids home as we need to. So dignity-driven practice is based, based on one kind of simple founding um, assumption, and that's that wherever there is violence or oppression, there is resistance. So you saw Sue unpack a little bit of that in the role play as she was trying to um, get Emma, was the mother? Yes. Um, getting Emma to, to tap into what she was doing when she left um, little Joel at home. So when we, was that you or me? When we seek to understand the child, young person or parent's resistance, we honour their act, acts, big or small, that they've taken in response to their experiences and we get to know the things that they've tried to do to keep their child safe. The really simple application of this practice um, that's useful for restoration work is a really simple change of language. It's about asking what someone did in response to the violence or oppression that's happening to them. Really simple. So what did you do next? Where were you when? And we saw Sue starting to do a little bit of that today in the role play. What this does is it restores dignity by helping parents see that they're not passive victims, um, that they're actually active agents in their own, own environment and that they are doing all they can to resist others. And it also gives us a different perspective. It's about us being really curious about the presenting risks and the possibility that some of the things that we're worried about might actually have once been an act of resistance, albeit not a useful one, but things like a parent who does use drugs or alcohol as a way to cope with past childhood abuse or drinking to cope with a partner that's currently violent towards them. Um, like Kate said, we're not going to condone the drinking or the drug abuse drug use, we still need to change that for child safety, but we're going to understand the roots of it and we're going to help parents understand that we understand where things have come from. It's about context and when we, when we have context we know that it's easier to develop our empathy. So a social response is how a parent receives messages from society about what they've done. So as an example, an unhelpful social response and one that we have probably all been part of or have seen in our practice is when we would say to a mother, um, if, she had, if there's an AVO in place and she's not breached the AVO, we might provide a social response that tells her that we blame her for not keeping her child safe, that she's the one who has to be responsible for the violence and we might even take her child when we think that she's not able to do that. Police will send their own social response to that mother as well, um, and that might result in, result in them not offering her the full benefits of a criminal system. They'll label her as colluding with her violent partner or putting her needs above those of her kids. But a helpful social response and one we really need to do for restoration to um, be a possibility, and I know I did say the word restoration, but I retrain myself out of that and unlearn it, um, is by exploring why she wouldn't breach her partner on an AVO. And what you might actually uncover is that she knows she would really, really cop it if the police turned up at her house again. And so for her, not breaching the AVO was actually the lesser of two evils for her. So the goal of restoration is actually a goal of hope. We've heard a few people talk about hope today. Dana spoke about it and Felicity said that she needed it straight away. And that's what dignity driven practice and being able to say right from the time that we take a child that we really want to get that child back home is giving that family some hope, the child and the parents. So why am I banging on about this when the agenda does say the SDM restoration tool? 
because as I said earlier, the tool is only as good as what information we put in it. And this tool, for anyone who has seen it, has some things that are fairly similar to your safety assessment. It's looking at protective capabilities, and this practice helps us unravel and, and find those maybe hidden protective capabilities. The other thing that the restoration tool does is it measures the case plan. So it's a little bit like the risk reassessment in terms of determining what level of change has happened with the restoration. But I want to talk about one from um, Bridges. It's called Bridges Transitional Model. It's actually from the 1970s and it's an organisational change theory. It's about leadership, not about child protection at all. But the thing that I like is it's about transition and it's about understanding what's the process that's going on for parents that is sitting behind the behaviour that we might see. And when I say behaviour, I mean our behaviour as well. So restoration is about us going through a change process, maybe not just as much as parents, but we'll be going through a change process as well. We have to shift gears really quickly Yesterday, we took a child, we thought that it was so high risk that it wasn't safe for that child to stay. And today I'm gonna to have to talk to that parent and say, I really genuinely think that I can get your child back home. We've got to do our own mental shift and processing. In our practice, we're developing case plans that set out the change required. We are really good at being able to say, this is what needs to change, this is who needs to do it, and this is the date that that needs to happen by. And more often than not, it's the parent that are laden up with all of the things that need to be done. And we take a bit of a backseat role as being the monitor and the reviewer of whether, whether tasks have been attained or not. But you will all have done case plans and they could have been really good case plans, but you still didn't get the outcome that you wanted. So what's that about? This is where I like this this theory because it helps us understand that the case plan is kind of the tip of the iceberg and there's all this other stuff going on underneath. So what this theory suggests is that case plans are focused on getting the change accomplished rather than on supporting parents through the transition. And there's three really kind of simple um, phases to this model that you'll be able to remember at the end of this session. The first phase is about letting go. This is about saying goodbye. It's about something in someone's life coming to an end, and that means loss. So in this stage, we're asking parents to let go of what they know is their way of living. We ask them to let go of what feels like their whole experience, and sometimes that will be letting go of their self-identity as well. Change behaviour doesn't occur if we don't give parents the time to bring their past to an ending. So we need to understand that no matter how dysfunctional their behaviour might seem to us, it's their life, it was their life, and they need to grieve its ending. And that's especially the case even if the parents actually want the same outcome as us, some change behaviour. We still need to recognise that there's a grieving process, there is grieving process, there is something that they're ending. So we need to give parents the time. In this phase, they might look like they're not stepping up to the tasks of the case plan, and you might start to get a bit anxious that they're not ready or they're not on the same page as you. They need a practitioner who can do what Sue did earlier today and sit with them, listen to them, and acknowledge their loss. We need to build in timeframes to our case plan that reflect that there is going to be this period. And that's really important with the restoration tool because it's about measuring progress. So if we've set a case plan that doesn't build in some of the process of change, we're actually gonna be setting parents up to fail in attaining their case plan goals. And the restoration tool will shoot you down a path of saying, stop restoration. What the tool doesn't do, doesn't do is tell you what a good case plan is. That's what you need to be doing and that's where your skills come in. Um, when parents are in this stage, um, they will have lots of feelings of fear 
and they'll need lots of information about the process. So things like what you heard earlier today, where's the child living, when am I going to see them, what's casework going to look like in the near future. In this stage, we're like the sounding board for parents with a non-judging ear and with the information giver. You would all, all have seen this in your work with parents. This is the stage where it looks like we've just got stuck. Nothing's happening. So in this stage, parents have let go of their old ways, but they're kind of finding themselves unable to start their new ways. They're in a bit of an, un, um, an in-between state. This stage is really full of uncertainty and confusion and for parents, they're spending most of their time just trying to deal with the uncertainty and confusion, not the actual task that we've put on top of them. So it is going to look a bit like they're not progressing and you might feel in this stage like you're the one doing all of the work. This stage requires all of our empathy. It's about understanding what it might be like for someone who has to give up all that they know and take on a new way of being when there's actually no guarantees that that new way will turn out the way that we all hope that it will. Um, this zone's actually a really uncomfortable zone, so people will try and get out of this zone. And what we will see in practice is families who either work really hard really quickly and do everything in a um, very short amount of time, or we'll see parents that start to relapse, that go backwards and revert back to their old ways of behaviours. That's part of what we need to hold as we're doing our case plans. This stage though is the most important stage because this is the stage where transformation starts to happen. And this is where our job is to be the motivator and keep their eye on the big prize. If parents go through this phase too quickly, we'll see case plans or restoration plans that don't stick. And that's when you'll see kids coming back into care and we'll also see parents going back to old ways of behaviour and our response may be an all or nothing response and that we then go straight into looking for long term orders rather than being able to stick with the parent through this stage. So I said earlier it's not just parents who are going to feel uncertain. Um, this is the stage where you might start to feel uncertain, a bit lost, a um, bit impatient, a bit worried that the change that you're trying to achieve just isn't going to happen, particularly when we've got things um, telling us that there's time frames that things need to happen for children. Um, so what we need to do is be really clear on understanding the difference between lapse and relapse, doing our best to keep hope alive, and probably the best way to do that in this stage is by really connecting with the kids they're going to want to go home, so draw your hope from them and that they want to go home. And finally, the phase of new beginnings. This is about moving forward. It's where we start to see new behaviour. Um, this too is a bit of a disconcerting stage because parents are actually having to um, put their competence on the table and there's a risk in doing that. They need to be vulnerable. And this is especially so when they have a history of a agency that they would view as punishing them. So they're going to be a bit nervous about testing out some of their new behaviours. In this stage, parents need us to notice everything. We need to notice the behaviour that's changed. We need to praise it. We need to let them know we've seen it and we need to praise them again. And we need to praise them again until they realise that they have created the change and that they can sustain it. So the tool will guide you with three different outcomes. Whether you should return that child home, whether you should continue with your restoration efforts, or whether it's not going to happen. Uh, and we need to look at alternate options for the child. Basically, that what we all know is that it is your relationships that will make the difference. But the tool can be useful. It is your space to stop, to think and to analyse. It's your space to explore any biases that you might be bringing to your practice. And it's also a space to look at how appropriate our case plan is. 
and hopefully for the agency um, and more so for the parents and kids that we work with, that it's a way of giving more consistent decision making. So hopefully some of you are, um, are getting used to the restoration tool at the moment and are able to use it to really guide and support your good practice. Thank you. Has anyone got any questions? I think we agreed not to do questions because we know the key to a good day is to get to people out the door on time. But um, it was such an interesting topic. I just wonder if anyone's got any burning questions. We have a question from a live streamer. Yep. It's from an NGO caseworker who asks, any tips for restorations that are happening after a long time in care? The children's ages are three and 13 and have been in care for two years in very stable placements. Yeah. Um, so without knowing the details, I don't really have any red hot tips, but what I would say is, um, and what I, I didn't say in that presentation, is that this tool is applicable for children who have just recently been taken into care and for children who've been in long-term care for anything from you know, one year up to 15 years. So as a, as a um, system, we are absolutely having a look at what is the best thing for children. Um, we know that children tend to return home to their parents at some point in their late adolescence, early adulthood. Um, restoration of, of children, like what the question asks, is definitely something, a, a place that maybe we've not gone to before, where once we've set a long-term goal we've kind of set and forget and worked on this real belief about permanency and that undoing that would not be the right thing for children. Um, what this, this is different though because we're actually talking about sending them back home. So we, don't, we want permanency in the sense that we don't want children moving from foster carer to foster carer but we're talking about turning kids, returning kids back home and if that's safe um, that is the best thing for them. But what it, what it involves to be the very best for those children is that partnership between the carer, the parents and the child, so that that parent doesn't feel like they've lost the world that they know. And wherever we can transition anything from the world that they had with their parents. And Tiffany spoke about things like um, their sport, their dance, whatever they're doing, wherever we can try and transition aspects of their life and care into their new world back with their parents. That's our best way of making the transition as smooth as possible for kids. 